kid. Thanks, Tyler Thompson. Thanks, guys. All right, uh, good evening. Could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2, verse 1? Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, at the, uh, we're going to study Daniel 2.19 this evening where Daniel, Daniel praises God uh, for revealing to him the mystery, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's mystery, in a night vision. So we're going to see uh, God gives Daniel an answer to his prayer, and Daniel responds to God's uh, the answered uh, prayer request and uh, by praising God. So uh, that'll be our subject here this evening. And also remember, at the end of class, we're going to have our prayer meeting. We haven't had one in like three weeks, so uh, we def- desperately need one. <laughs> so prayer, prayer meeting is right after class. Everyone's invited. So uh, without further ado, let's take a moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves to hear this, what the Spirit's going to say to the church this evening. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day to study your word, another day to enjoy fellowship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with other members of the body of Christ. We thank you, Father, for uh, the gift of your Son and his great sacrifice on the cross for us. We thank you for raising him from the dead for our justification, and also to give us the guarantee of a resurrection body. We thank you for the Spirit's work in our lives, from regeneration to resurrection. And we thank you for your, your plan on eternity past predestinating us to be conformed to the image of your Son, electing us to the privilege of having a relationship and fellowship with yourself, Father. We know that you're holy, we know we have no merit with you, and we know that we have a relationship and fellowship with you uh, simply because of what your Son did for us at the cross. And we also, Father, we know that we can go to you, your throne of grace now. It's a throne of grace now because of what your Son did at the cross for us and dying as our substitute. So, Father, we thank you for loving us unconditionally, self-sacrificially, and we just pray, Father, that we can reflect that love in our relationships with the other members of the body of Christ and all people so that we might draw the unsaved to the Savior, to a saving knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the study in the book of Daniel, and we pray that you would guide us and direct us in this study, and we pray that it would be a blessing to the body of Christ now and into the future. We thank you for the Thompsons opening up their home. We thank you, Father, for... Uh, everyone here this evening and also those uh, on Pal Talk or those who might be viewing and uh, listening to this class at a later date through the website. Father, we just pray that you would uh, uh, this evening guide the communicator and empowering him to impart to your people your full counsel. And we also pray that you would help all those in the audience to concentrate and to have sensitivity to the Spirit's guidance and direction. And we pray that you would also give Tyler wisdom and Titus wisdom with the sound in the recordings. We pray that the technology would function properly uh, in the Thompson home. And we pray that as a result of this Bible class, we'd have a great time fellowshipping in your word, continuing to grow in the grace and knowledge of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is in his name we pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1 is where you should all be. We're going to study Daniel 2.19, which where we see Daniel praises God for revealing to him the, uh, the mystery of Nebuchadnezzar's mystery in a night vision. Remember that mystery is the fact that nobody knew what the content of Nebuchadnezzar's dream was and nobody knew the interpretation. Uh, only ne- Nebuchadnezzar knew the content of the dream because it was given to him. But the explanation of the dream is uh, all in, in the, uh, res- resided in, in God's uh, wisdom and his omniscience and his, and his character and nature. So we see that God, uh, answers, uh, uh, God answers Daniel's prayer because Uh, Daniel needed to be delivered from physical death. He and the rest of the wise men were under the sentence of death because the occult priests, the necromancers, the witches, and the astrologers were uh, failed to meet the king's demand in providing him the content of the dream. We saw that the the, uh, wise men, these necromancers, uh, uh, occult uh, occult priests, witches, and astrologers, they were uh, one of the content of the dream so that they could have something to work off and give him an interpretation, which, of course, 
would be not really an interpretation at all. They were deceiving him. So we see that uh, he refuses to do so because he knows that he wants them to, he wants to determine if they can actually interpret dreams and are therefore in touch with the gods as they claim. And the best way to do that is let them tell me what the content of the dream was, which would be tantamount to reading my mind. And that, that would definitely tell me that they're in touch with the supernatural and that they can interpret dreams. But they failed to do so. And so Nebuchadnezzar, in a fit of rage, he sentences all the wise men to death, including the dignitaries and diplomats in, his, in the city of Babylon, which would include Daniel and his three friends. And these diplomats and dignitaries, along with Daniel and his three friends, were innocent. They are not the ones who were deceiving the king and saying that they could do something that they, not, that they, they could not. So they were uh, unjustly suffering at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel comes to the rescue. Daniel, with wisdom intact, talks to Arioch, the guy who's going to do the execution, and he talks him into letting uh, De- uh, him go to Nebuchadnezzar and ask for time to get the content of the dream from the father and the interpretation. So now we're seeing God has answered this prayer. We'll see that this evening. And Daniel's going to respond in thanksgiving to the father. So look at Daniel chapter 2 verse 1. And as is, as is my custom, I'll insert into the translation Uh, my own translation, and change the translation as I see fit. And the reasons for this have been documented. uh, They're documented on the website, or will be if they haven't been there already. And also, we've documented it uh, through the various classes that we have videoed uh, videoed, uh, those classes and also audio recorded them as well. So look at Daniel 2.1. Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his soul was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the occult priests, the necromancers, the witches, and the astrologers to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my soul is anxious to understand the dream. Then the astrologers, who are speaking for the rest of the the other three groups, spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the content of the dream to your servants, and then we will declare the interpretation. The king replied to the astrologers, The command from me is irrevocable, namely that if you do not make known to me the content of the dream, as well as its interpretation, you'll be torn limb from limb, and your homes will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the content of the dream, as well as its interpretation, you'll receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the content of the dream, as well as its interpretation. And they answered a second time and said, let the king tell the content of the dream to his servants, and then we will declare the interpretation. And the king replied, I know for certain that you were bargaining for time because you have seen that the command from me is irrevocable. Namely, if you do not make known the content of the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. For you have conspired together to speak lying and corrupt words in my presence until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the content of the dream in order that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. And the astrologers answered the king and said, There's not a man or a person on the face of the earth who could declare this matter for the king. Consequently, no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any occult priest, necromancer, or astrologer. Indeed, the the demand which the king is exacting is extremely difficult. It's impossible. And there's no one else who could declare it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling place is not with the human race. Now, because of this, the king became indignant, yes, very furious, and he gave orders to execute each and every one of the wise men of the city of Babylon. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be executed, and consequently, they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. Then Daniel replied with wisdom intact to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to execute the wise men of the city of Babylon. He said to Arioch, the king's commander, for what reason is the order from the king so uh, uncompromisingly severe? Then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Remember, uh, for the sake of brevity, Daniel leaves out the fact that he was required to uh, present the content of the dream. We know from the rest of the chapter, he did provide the content of the dream. The king was expecting him to provide the content of the dream 
uh, for him along with the interpretation. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his home and he informed his friends Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah about this matter. So that they might, in order that they might request merciful acts from the God who exercises authority over the heavens because of this mystery. So in order that Daniel, or for the purpose that Daniel and his friends would not be executed with the rest of the wise men of the city of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. And then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now in verse 19, we have two parts we're going to take this evening. Uh, very, Both are very brief. First of all, the phrase, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. That's composed of a temporal adverb, at a yin, which we've seen in the past. It's correctly translated here with the, phrase, with the word then. Then we have a prepositional phrase. We have the preposition lamed, whose object is the word, the proper noun, Daniel, which is, means Daniel. And then we have another prepositional phrase that follows it. We have the preposition beth translated in, and its object is the noun, kezev. And this is translated here correctly, vision. And it's modified, this word's modified by the relative particle d, which is not translated, and it's followed by the noun, Layla. And this is translated here, night. And then we have the noun for mystery, raz, araz. And then we have the verb. We have the, the verb gela, which is translated here, was revealed. And that's in the uh, pe'il, pe um, uh, passive participle form. And that's the Hebrew, uh, the, that stem is the equivalent to that stem is in the Hebrew is the cal passive. So here the word then is the temporal adverb and again, it's a temporal coordinator, and, that, and it means then, and its reason why it's a temporal coordinator is that it shows consecutive events in the narrative. So what this word's doing, it's introducing a statement that's telling us, the reader, the next event that took place after Daniel and his friends went to the father in prayer, requesting that he would reveal the content of the king's dream as well as its interpretation. Now the purpose of this request we saw was to prevent the king from executing Daniel and his friends along with the rest of the city of Babylon's wise men. Now this word, Edeyin, it introduces a statement that tells the reader that God revealed this mystery to Daniel in a night vision. And thus, we're going to see the wise men and Daniel and his three friends are all have are been delivered from death by God. Now the word for mystery, Raz, it refers to the content of Nebuchadnezzar's recurring dream, which he would not reveal, as you recall, he would not reveal it to his occult priests, necromancers, witches, and astrologers who helped to compose his wise men. This word mystery also refers to the interpretation of this dream, because that's what the, the king also demanded that from his wise men as well. Now the content of the dream was a mystery because the king would not reveal it to his wise men. So in one sense, the particular dream, is a, which was a vision that God gave him in a revelation about future events, was, uh, was given to him. It was a mystery to all the wise men. And of course, the king knew what the content of the dream was. He just didn't understand what it meant. So we see that in one sense, this, uh, this dream was a mystery to the wise men because Nebuchadnezzar refused to reveal the content of the dream. On the other hand, the interpretation was a mystery to Nebuchadnezzar as well because the meaning of the dream could only be, be known, it could only be known if God revealed it. So we see that this word mystery is describing the vision, the revelation that God gave Nebuchadnezzar in a dream, in a vision, and we saw that it's a mystery to the wise men because the king wouldn't reveal the content of the dream, and it's a mystery to everybody in concern, including the king, because no one knew the interpretation of it. No one understood the meaning of it. And the only way anybody could understand the meaning of it was if God revealed what it meant. And he uses Daniel to do that. He gives everybody understanding, and he gives us, the reader, understanding. And this, remember, the rest of the chapter tells us that it's a revelation about the future world empires. Remember, this Daniel was written in the 6th century B.C., it's talking about this dream, this vision that God gave Nebuchadnezzar, this revelation is about future world empires, the Babylonian Empire, the Media Persian Empire, which conquered Babylon well after Nebuchadnezzar had died. And then there was also Alexander the Great's Greece, uh, that Grecian Empire, that Greek Empire, followed the Media Persian Empire in history. These were all immediately success, success, successive to each other. Nebu uh, Alexander the Great died at 32 years of age, and his four generals split it up. And that was predicted in the prophecy uh, in, in Daniel chapter 7 as well. 
And we also saw that following uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Alexander the Great's Greece, is the Roman Empire, and that all these empires have come and gone in history. There's, and, but the as we'll see, the the, to, the feet of this particular uh, statue that uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw in a vision, it, the feet refer to the revived form of the Roman Empire, which is yet to show up on the fa- on the pages of history yet, and so that's yet future. And then, of course, the uh, we also see that Nebuchadnezzar saw a, a stone. Uh, which was not cut out by human hands that destroyed the image, the statue that he saw. And that was speaking of Christ's second advent and it says that the stone filled the earth which speaks of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So we have a panorama of human history. Uh, We've seen much of it has been fulfilled in history and yet there's still much of it to be fulfilled in, uh, t- uh, up to our day and age so this is the mystery with no one understood what the content of this dream was uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar knew the content Daniel found out but Daniel needed to know the interpretation as well and only God could give it to him so who gave Nebuchadnezzar this vision this uh, vision in a dream he uh, God did and God was trying to communicate with Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, the wise men of Babylon, and the whole world. And he's done that because this book is now in what we call the Bible. This particular prophecy, this revelation about the future, which Bible scholars call the times, of the, it talks about the times of the Gentiles, which we're still in at this present moment in history. Now the word for revealed, the word Gelah, it's used here with the noun Raz, mystery, as its subject, and God is the unexpressed but clearly implied agency with Daniel as its indirect object. So this indicates that in answering the prayer of Daniel and his friends, the Father revealed the content of Nebuchadnezzar's revelatory dream as well as its interpretation. Now remember, uh, this is uh, an answer to Daniel's prayer. This is a merciful act of God because remember, Daniel and his friends, as we saw last evening, were appealing to God and they wanted merciful acts from God. They were requesting that God be merciful to them. And so by giving them the content of the dream in the, in the interpretation, that was a merciful act of God which resulted in the deliverance of the wise men and Daniel and his three friends from physical death. So this recurring dream was a revelation from God concerning God's future program for planet Earth. So you and I have been told the future. We've been told what's going to take place in the future. We've seen that uh, the, the much of the prophecy has been fulfilled in history, but there's still much to be fulfilled uh, yet. And, and, and we're going to see, again, the revived form of the Roman Empire, the United States of Europe. We know it's going to be the United States of Europe because uh, it's a ten-nation confederacy. And we saw that also that uh, Antichrist will be a Roman. He will be a Roman dictator. We'll see that We saw that clearly in Daniel chapter 9. We'll see it again clearly when we get to that particular chapter. And uh, we saw that the false prophet uh, will be someone who's going to promote Antichrist. And if Antichrist is a Roman and the false prophet is supposed to be uh, someone who comes off meek as a lamb, but he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, that's talked about in Revelation 13. Well, that a great, uh, it could very well be one of the popes uh, that could be uh, someone who looks real meek and mild like a lamb, but in, in, inwardly, he's far from it. And uh, so we see that that's all yet future. The, millennial, the second advent of Christ and the millennial reign are all yet future. They have not been fulfilled in history yet. So this uh, dr- recurring dream contains knowledge of what would take place in the future. This revelation from God concerned itself with the future Gentile world powers as well as the future of the nation of Israel. It spoke of the kingdom of God being established on earth through his son and which kingdom he will establish at his second advent. So this dream in chapter 2 is telling all of us, telling the whole world, telling Israel, telling the Gentiles that God will establish his kingdom through his son Jesus Christ, his millennial reign. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that after the millennial reign that the son is going to uh, hand over the kingdom to the father and all everything will be all in all and the father will be sov- is sovereign over this kingdom and his son Jesus Christ, is a go- he's going to establish his k- kingdom with, through Jesus Christ at his second advent. Now the word for vision there, kezev, it's a cognate of the Hebrew noun kazon, which is also means visions, of course, which appeared in Daniel 1.17. Now, it indicates that God gave Daniel revelation with regards to his future plans and visions. Here in Daniel 2.19, this Aramaic noun, Kezev, it means visions, and it refers to Daniel receiving a supernatural revelation from God 
at night while he was awake. So the vision was not while he was sleeping. He, God basically projected into his mind what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed and then told Daniel the, the, what it was. Now, there's no one in history, no one right now is getting such a thing from God because we have the completed canon of Scripture. God's not doing this sort of thing anymore. But he did do it for Daniel. So Daniel went through a, a very uh, uh, unique experience, or, or I could say unique to the prophets of Israel. He went through a, a unique process where God was giving them, him this revelation basically by projecting into his mind a vis vision of what would come in the future. Now, some expositors believe that this word in Daniel 2.19, Kezev, visions, is a, is a synonym for, for a dream. However, if God revealed the content of the king's dream in its interpretation in a dream, Daniel would have used the noun Kalem, which appears in Daniel chapter 2, verses 5, 6, 7, and 9. Instead, he uses the word kezev here, for the word for visions, which refers to a revelation from God. In other words, it was an appearance of something in Daniel's mind as a supernatural revelation to communicate a truth not seen as a sensory perception. So as we'll get when we get to it, it was a very intimidating, when Daniel describes it to Nebuchadnezzar, it was intimidating to even the most intimidating man in the world at that time, Nebuchadnezzar. It scared him. It was intimidating. It was towering over him. It had a head of gold. We saw that the uh, that we saw the head of gold in the in the breast. The 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 breast was made of breast and the arms were made of silver, and the th the thighs and the belly were made of uh, bronze, and the legs. We saw, we'll see that the legs were made of iron and the feet were partly of iron and clay, which spoke of the Roman Empire, the feet. So we see that that was a tremendous and it, it was bright and shining and it was extraordinary. The light it gave off was not of this world as we'll see. So this is what Daniel's seeing in his, getting this vision in his mind, just like Nebuchadnezzar got it. So uh, we see here that visions and we're talking about visions here. It wasn't a dream. Visions were often a revelation of the future plans of God, which, would, which could involve either judgment or blessing. Now, this word, kezev, visions, in Daniel 2.19, it speaks of revelation from God, the Holy Spirit, with regards to the Father's will for an individual or a nation or the earth as a whole. Now, in our passage, this word denotes that God gave Daniel revelation with regards to his future plans, which, which is demonstrated clearly in chapter 2 and throughout this particular book. Now, the word, in, in, if you look at verse uh, 19, it says, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel. Then it says, in a night vision. Now, the word, that's the, the particle D, it means during. And when, so it's translated in your Bibles. Uh, let's see how they translate. In a night vision. So they translate it with the word in. Now, the word in there is the particle it's not translated here, but it actually means during. And it functions, and the reason why is it, it functions as a marker relating points of time. And here, the two points of time are the night and the moment Daniel received this revelation from God. So this word, the relative particle D, which is not translated in your Bibles, denotes that this mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision during the night. Now, the word kezev, visions, is modified by the word Layla which means night, and the night, of course, is a period of time between sunset and sunrise, and here this word is telling the reader that Daniel received this vision at night. So we know the very, that same evening when he went home, he prayed, and that very same evening, God gave him the content of the dream and its interpretation in a vision. And so that was at night, and the very following next morning, he'd be going back to the king. So it didn't take very long for him to get an answer to prayer. Now let's finish off the verse. It says in, in verse 19, Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a, during the night in a vision. Then it says, Daniel blessed the God of heaven. He's responding to God's merciful act and we're giving to him the content of the dream and the, the interpretation of the king's dream. So he's responding to God in thanksgiving, as we'll see, and worship. So the phrase, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, that starts off with the temporal adverb again, at a yin, which is translated here, then. And this is followed by, again, the word for Daniel, Daniel. And then we have the verb. We have the pa'el, active perfect form of the verb, barak, which is translated here, 
uh, blessed. Now, remember, you, uh, there's a, the Colonel Theme has a church. Called, uh, 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 there's a church that Colonel Theme pastored for years. It was called Baraka Church. Bob Theme pastored a church called Baraka. Well, this particular, uh, that's from a Hebrew term that talks about blessing. So this word barak, the verb barak, is found here. It's translated blessed, and we're going to find out what that means. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what blessed means when you're blessing God here. We understand God blessing us many times, uh, but we don't know why Daniel's blessing God. And, uh, and as we'll see, it has to do with praise and thanksgiving. Now, this, is, this particular clause is fa- uh, completed with a prepositional phrase that begins with a preposition lamed, which is not translated in its object, is the word for God there, Elah. And that's referring to the Father. And then lastly, we have the masculine plural form of the noun, Shamayin, translated heaven. It actually is talking about the first, second, and third heaven, as we saw last evening. Now, as was the case the first time, uh, the word was used in Daniel 2.19. This temporal adverb, et a yin, translated then, shows consecutive events in the narrative. So here it introduces a statement that's telling us, the reader, the next event that took place after God revealed the content of the king's dream as well as its interpretation to Daniel during the night in a vision. So this word, at a yin, then, it introduces a statement that says that Daniel Praise the God of the heavens. Now, the word for blessed is the word barak, as we saw. And it's used here with Daniel as its subject, and God is its object. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean that Daniel barak God? It actually talks about, a during, this word barak, blessed, it actually means this. And here's an instance where the word, you need more than one word to communicate what the word says in the original language. So this word is referring to adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving that is directed towards the Father by Daniel as a result of the Father fulfilling his prayer request that he, could, he would reveal to him the king's dream and its interpretation. So when you see this word blessed, it means to uh, have adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving of the Father. Let me uh, give you my translation of this particular verse. Next, in a vision, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel. Then Daniel showered the God of the heavens with adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving. So we could translate this word, showered the Father, God the Father, the God of the heavens, with adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving. See, I've told you in the past that some of these words in the original text, whether it's in the Aramaic of Daniel, or the Hebrew of the Old Testament, or the New Testament, the Koine Greek, there are some words that are difficult to translate uh, with one English word. For instance, uh, the word uh, eulogetos, uh, an Erasmus pronunciation of the word that's translated blessed, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 1.3, Peter uses the same expression in one of his introductions to his epistles. That means worthy of praise and glorification is the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So you need more than one word to actually convey the depth of the meaning of the word in the original language. So the word there... This particular word, barak, blessed, it refers to adoring praise and honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving that Daniel showered on God the Father for answering his prayer. So therefore, this word denotes that Daniel showered the Father with adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving because he fulfilled his prayer request. And now, I wonder how many times, here's stop and think about this, What, what can we learn from this? When God gives us an answer to prayer, especially something very, very important to Daniel, his, Daniel, his life was at stake. We should be showering God with praise. In fact, I'll tell you right now, to the, if God has done some mighty things for you and he has for all of us, I'll just give you for myself. I, oh, from the, the many things I've, God did for me way back in the past, way back to when I was like 19 years, ago, years old, I thank God for the answered prayers and the deliverances that he gave me in the past right up to this day. I try to remember all the things that he's done for me and right up to this present moment. And I'm trying trying I'm trying to learn from the scriptures and the writers of scripture how they responded to God. And they never forgot the things that God did for them. Uh, Many of the great men of faith like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, 
Paul, the apostles, uh, the prophets of Israel. It's good to remember God for these things and then shower him with praise. So when we talk about blessing God, we should give him adoring praise for his, the, all the answered prayers that he's given us. And the, we should give him honor. We should give him recognition. We should worshipfully, we should, thanks, we should offer him thanksgiving for all that he's done for us. See, that's the sign uh, of the fact that you, uh, we can always tell a mature believer that he doesn't spend most of his time complaining. What he does is that he worships God and he gives thanks to God. See, the, the, the attitude of gratitude is a great marker of where you are at spiritually. If you're a complainer, and you, I'm not saying everybody complains from time to time. I'm talking about if you're a chronic complainer as a Christian, it's a good sign that you're, you're a very immature Christian. So the more you grow up spiritually, the more you'll be spending thanking God, and you'll even thank God when things are not going right, right in your life. Uh, that, that takes a very a great level of maturity and an understanding of God and His will for your life to be able to have that kind of uh, uh, attitude in the face of adversity and offer up thanksgiving to God. So this word, uh, Barak, denotes that Daniel expressed adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving for the Father revealing the content of Nebuchadnezzar's dream as well as its interpretation. So this revelation manifested God's wisdom, power, sovereignty, grace, and omniscience, which Daniel praises in Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. In fact, uh, this is kind of interesting. We'll develop this next week, not uh, today. But if you look at verse 19, it says, Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel during the night in a vision, and then Daniel showered uh, the Father, God, the God of the heavens, with adoring praise and worshipful thanksgiving and honor and recognition. And then it says in verse 20, verses 20 through 23, now uh, exp uh, it basically break it out what Daniel praised God for. And it says in verse 20, Daniel said, let the name of the person of God be blessed forever and ever. Why? For wisdom and power belong to him. They're part of his attributes. It is he who changes or the times and the epochs, meaning he sets the appointed times and the duration of times. He removes, deposes kings, and he raises them up. He establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness in the future, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now, you have made known to me what we requested of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. So verses 20 through 23, it breaks out this idea of Daniel uh, it's showering God with adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving. So thanksgiving is, a, this is what we see here, is bringing out an, a, an, an aspect, one of the most essential characteristics and as, aspects of a productive prayer life, which we studied in the past. Uh, we did a book on that, remember. One of the essential items of prayer, a productive prayer life, is you have to confess your sins. Otherwise, your prayers will not be answered if you're out of fellowship. You have to have faith. You have to be filled with the Spirit. And in fact, uh, when you're filled with the Spirit, you're praying according to God's will. You have to have thanksgiving. In you. you should be an individual who sh uh, sprinkles his, thanks uh, his prayers with thanksgiving. Let me show you Paul, an example of Paul, in addition to Daniel. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse 1, please. Hold your place. Philipp go to Philippians chapter 4. Look at, look at uh, Philippians 4, 6. One of my favorite passages in all the Bible. Philippians 4, 6. Oh, the net Bible, yeah, those the pages are so light, I, I stick all the time. Yeah. Philippians 4, 6. It says in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. It's actually more emphatic in the, uh, in the original. It means be, absolutely, be anxious for absolutely nothing. But in everything, look, it says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, then here's something important, with thanksgiving, 
Let your requests be made known to God. Don't miss that. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So what he's saying is, don't be worried about anything, but pray and let your prayer be sprinkled with thanksgiving. So that's important. That's an important aspect of a productive prayer life. It's not always going to God and, uh, and just demanding things of him left and right. It's thanking him for what he's done. In fact, you should thank him in advance for the answered prayer. That's showing real faith in him, and that's another aspect of a productive prayer life. Another essential aspect of it is faith. You shouldn't, if you're going to ask for something, you should ask you for it in faith and not be double-minded. So we see that Thanksgiving was a big part of the Philippian prayer life and Paul's prayer life because Paul's teaching him this. Prayer, don't be anxious, pray on the thing. And then uh, he says, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then he says, here's the result in verse seven of this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So there's Paul and the Philippians, Paul teaching that thanksgiving is an important aspect of prayer. And, uh, and, and in, uh, in prayer, we should be thanking God for the answered prayer request. It's a good thing to practice this. Go back and look at your life. See, it takes time to do these things, but you'll benefit in the long run. Look back at what God has done for you. I look, like I said before, I look back at things I was when I, when I first became a believer at 19 and still thank Him for things. It, and it's from, I should do that. And it, it keeps me reminding me of where God has brought me and where he's taken me from and how he's delivered me over and through many trials and tribulations and how he's been faithful. That gives me confidence that God will be faithful for the present moment and in the future. So Thanksgiving, as we remember, we studied this in Exodus. Exodus generation did a terrible job of remembering what God did for them because if they spent more time uh, remembering what he did for them and thanking him, they would spend less time complaining. So if you got a problem with complaining, and I think everybody does because we're all sinners. The best way around that is to thank God. Let's say you're in a bad mood. Let's say you're feeling depressed. Maybe you're feeling slighted and left out and you feel lonely and just, you know, I don't know, whatever's going on in your life. One of the best things, way to get out of that is start thanking God. Sit down and thank him for everything you got. Hey, you could say, I mean, you might be saying, well, geez, you know, I mean, I mean that, always look at the glass as half full rather than half empty. I mean, if you, if you don't have, uh, you know, you thank, thank God for uh, your, you thank God for everything in your life that you can think of. And you, if you really sit there and think about it, you can thank him for everything because our whole being, our existence is dependent upon God and how he treats us in grace. I mean, just think, don't, don't just think about the temporal blessings. Look about all the, look at all the, the spiritual blessings that you have because you're in union with Christ, think about those too. So if we look at the temporal blessings and the spiritual blessings that we know from the word of God, we're going to have a lot of things to thank God for. And uh, not just ask him and requesting him for things. It's important that we thank him for previous things that he's given us and answered prayer requests. And that'll give us confidence for the future as well. So we see here that, uh, that Daniel, if you go back to Daniel, go back now to Daniel chapter 2 verse 19. And we'll cl- we're coming near the end here. Daniel 2.19. Daniel chapter 2, verse 19. So it says in Daniel 2.19. It says in Daniel 2.19, Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then it says, Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now the word for God there, as we saw, is Elah. It means God. It refers to the Father. That's the member of the Trinity that it's referring to. Now, how do we know this? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ taught that all prayer must be addressed to the Father. That's in Luke 11, 1 and 2. Even though Daniel and his friends lived centuries before the Lord taught this, the Father would have been the recipient of this prayer request from Daniel and his three friends in the the 6th century B.C. How do we know that? Well, it's indicated by the fact that that the Lord's teaching that you should pray to the Father in my name was not only instruction to the apostles, his disciples, as to how they were to pray, but it was also a revelation as to which member of the Trinity receives prayer. Because I'm going to take you to a place in Romans 8 where we see that the Son and the Spirit, they both pray to the Father. That's always been the case. 
So Jesus was teaching his disciples something that's always been true, that it, the Father is the one who's been receiving these prayer requests. Even the Son and the Spirit pray to the Father. Now hold your place. Uh, you don't have to hold. Yeah, you can hold your place. Uh, go to uh, Romans chapter 8, please. See if I can show you here. Look at Romans 8. So again, even though Daniel and his three friends never heard the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, who they were praying to was the Father. And we know that because the Father is, that, that teaching of Jesus was not only instruction for the present moment and for the church age and on into the future, but it was also a revelation as to who was the member of the Trinity that's receiving prayer, even from the Son and the Spirit. Now look, look at Romans chapter 8. See if I can find, for, find it for you. Look at verse 26. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But look what it says. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the, sa the saints according to the will of God, the will of the Father. So there's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is uh, praying to the Father for us, interceding for us. And so is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, look at, uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. That's the Father we're referring to. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. What is he doing? Who also intercedes for us. Who is he interceding, to, praying to? The Father. So here we have the Holy Spirit and the Son have always prayed to the Father. So when Jesus came out and taught in Roman, uh, Luke 11 and other places in John's gospel to pray to the Father, they asked him, how do you pray? Pray to the Father in my name. The Father has always been the member of the Trinity that's received prayer because the Spirit and the Son have done that from eternity past, have been praying. So we see here that the word Elah, you can go back now to Daniel chapter 2, verse 19, the word for God there is referring to the Father. It's not referring to Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, nor is it referring to the, it's, nor is it referring to the Holy Spirit. So we see in Daniel 2.19, it says, then, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel during the night in a vision. And remember, that was God basically projecting into his mind. He wasn't dreaming. The word is Caleb. It's speaking of a vision. And so basically he's getting the content of the, the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar received, Daniel received. And now, not only that, but Daniel received the interpretation unlike Nebuchadnezzar. So the, the, this vision was actually projected into the mind of Daniel. Then it says, then Daniel, in response to this, Daniel blessed the God of the heavens. And when it says the God of heaven, the word heaven there, it's in the plural, and it's in the plural, and it's actually referring to the first, second, and third heaven, as we saw last evening. And actually, the phrase means the God who exercises authority over the heavens, meaning God's sovereign. So he's praying, he says, he's praising the God and worshipfully thanks, giving him thanksgiving, showering him with praise and glory and honor and recognition and thanksgiving as a result of answering his prayer request. Because now, Daniel and his friends are spirit, and so are the rest of the wise men as well, because now they can meet the king's demand. And this shows you the power of prayer. It was all the result of a corporate prayer meeting. Uh, four guys got together, and they can't, and they, and the four of them, uh, uh, they were able, they're, 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 the, there was power in their prayer, and God that night gave them the answer to their prayer, and thus they were, in response to this, they showered him with aff affection, with thanksgiving, with honor, with recognition, and praise because of what he did for them. Now they're, they're saved, delivered from death, but also the benefit of that is God gave them a glimpse into the future. He got, let them and the rest of us to see what's going to happen in the future. And as I said before, much of this vision, that, this revelation from God that Nebuchadnezzar received and Daniel saw and received and interpreted has been fulfilled in history, but there's still much more of it to come to be fulfilled in history. We still haven't seen it yet. Uh, the, 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 the whole prophecy fulfilled completely. Well, let's, uh, what that closes our, our uh, wraps up our classes for this week in Book of Daniel. We'll be, this Sunday, we'll be uh, studying Exodus. We'll be doing, beginning, uh, we'll start a study of Exodus chapter 23 on Sunday uh, morning. So hope to see all, you, all of you there at that time. And uh, let's close in prayer and then we'll have our prayer meeting. We'll take a couple of minute break and then we'll have our prayer meeting. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you for everyone here this evening. We pray that this class would be a blessing to the body of Christ and bring glory and honor to you. So, Father, we pray for these things in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen.